Aizita Magania is the Director of Policy, Planning, and Public Partnerships for the Vaccine Preventable Disease Control Program at the LA County Department of Public Health. She has over 20 years of public health-related experience. Her focus has included the health and well-being of women, children, and families, health disparities in community health. Uh, she has a bachelor's in women's studies from UC Berkeley and an MPH from the University of Michigan. Uh, Izita today is going to be talking about promoting immunizations recommended for pregnant women, uh, and the objectives include increased understanding of the benefits of immunizations for pregnant women and then promoting strategies to improve communication with pregnant women about immunization. And just to provide a, a brief background, uh, we had heard from a lot of you and your sites that there was, given the current cold and flu season, there was a lot of questions coming up with families in terms of, hey, can I vaccinate myself? Am I supposed to be vaccinating my baby? How do I keep my baby safe? And so on and so forth. So um, Izita's presentation is really coming at a great time for us, given that we are still in the middle of a very heavy uh, season of uh, various preventable immunization pre preventable um, cases. So, Izita, I'm going to pass it on to you. Thank you again so much for being present with us. Thank you for having me. Good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can get this going. So, um, as Charlene shared with you, we're going to do an overview about uh, a little bit about how vaccines work, their safety and effectiveness, specific immunizations for pregnant women that we want to promote, including flu and pertussis, our whooping cough and then strategies to promote um, those to women, pregnant women, um, which is basically what, how, we, how we want to speak to people when we talk about immunization. Um, I'm so pleased for the opportunity to talk with all of you. I, I like to joke, even though I'm so proud to work for public health, that public health is famous for throwing parties that no one comes to. And you all bring the party to people's homes, and maybe they don't always want a party, but you have uh, the privilege of being in people's homes, and I know that um, what you do is really special, and we as public health um, get to build upon all of your good efforts of building trust and um, understanding and communication. So I just want to thank you. I'm so thrilled that um, the program has been expanded and um, you're all out there um, doing your work. I know there's people who are RNs on the, um, participating in the call, so if you have um, information you want to share, if you want to correct me, I'm not an RN um, and I'm newer to immunization, um, please feel free to do so. If you have questions, I'm going to take them down and if I can't answer them today, I will definitely get back to you. If there's other resources you need, um, I can provide those at a later time as well. So I know that, I, I don't know if coronavirus is on everyone's uh, minds right now, it's in the news a lot. So I just wanted to start with that and get it out of the way and remind people that the risk of transmission in LA is very low. And um, like flu, you know, what you need to do is stay home when you're sick, wash your hands, cover your cough, um, and sneeze. And that's how you prevent uh, influenza and it's how you're going to prevent coronavirus. And at some point there will be a vaccine for that too. I know they're working on it. So I've included some links here. If that's something that's on your mind, it's in the news. Um, here's some references for you. Um, this is from the news headline yesterday, a, a deadly virus is spreading. We have people who are sick, we have a virus that is spreading, and we have people who um, um, you know, are very sick and being hospitalized. But that virus really is flu, is what I want to tell you. And we have 68 children who have died so far at this, in this flu season. And compared to 170 people who have died so far, or I'm sorry, almost 400 people have died from the coronavirus worldwide. But we have um, 10,000 flu deaths so far in the USA for this current flu season, and we've had um, children die. So eye on the prize on this. I, I'm not telling people, and I appreciate everyone's concern about coronavirus, um, and it's in the news, but we want people to um, stay where the real threat is at this moment, which is flu. And this is, happens every year. This isn't a surprise. Um, So a little bit, and some of you know this, um, what are vaccines? They help us prevent 
disease, they help us develop immunity. When you get a flu shot, um, it stimulates your immune system, repairs your immune system for an infection. It doesn't actually give you a smaller version of the illness to help you get immunity. It trains your immune system um, to recognize a virus when you get it. And you can get that by injection or um, in the case of the flu, we have a, a, a flu mist. So again, you receive a weakened or dead form of a, of a disease germ or virus. It doesn't give you the disease. It allows your body to make antibodies that can fight it. And I have this very simplistic idea of immunizations in my mind. I don't know if any of you are too, too old to remember, but there used to be this game called doorbell ditch where you ring someone's doorbell when we were kids and you'd run away. We thought it, that was funny. And, and, and flu shots or other vaccinations are sort of like that. They knock on your immune system's door and your immune system comes running to the door with their fists up and says like, who's there? And no one's there, um, but the virus and the, uh, that's, that's provided the immunity that's provided by the immunization then primes your immune system and prepares it. So that middle picture is like you get that vaccination, your immune system's in play, and when that virus actually shows up, you're prepared to fight it. Just an example of where we've come with um, vaccine preventable diseases over time. If we look at the beginning of the century of, of the 1900s um, to this uh, present time, um, for example, you see mumps, there was 162,000 cases, 6,000 now, polio, 16,000 cases, um, zero now, tetanus, almost 633 now, pertussis, 200,000 cases, 19,000 now, um, measles, 530,000 cases, and that number that's listed there, 120, is actually more than that. We've had um, an increase of measles, as you probably heard in the news, um, about 1,200 cases in the U.S. last year. Things like smallpox are zero, polio is zero, really significant and deadly vaccine-preventable diseases that we've been able to eradicate with immunizations. So a lot of people might think that the one way to get immune from an illness is to get sick with it, and then you have the antibodies in your system. Um, that, that's called natural immunity. And of course, um, getting um, these diseases can be really, really um, dangerous, and they're also deadly. So you may not actually die of the flu, but it can really take down your immune system to the point where you are now vulnerable to secondary infections like pneumonia. If you're someone who has heart disease, you're more likely statistically, if you have flu, to have a heart attack um, soon after you've recovered from flu. People who have other chronic illnesses are much more susceptible to secondary um, infections. So depending on what the disease is, vaccines can be um, um, effective from 85 to 95 percent. It depends on what vaccine it is. It depends on what disease it is. It depends on how healthy you are. And I like to tell someone, as people like to say, well, the, um, the flu wasn't a good match or they, they didn't pick a good strain this year, that some protection, protection is always better than no protection. People always have questions about side effects and they're very, very rare. When you get um, vaccines, you can expect some redness or swelling. Maybe your arm will feel a little bit hard. You might even have a mild fever and that will go away within a few days. Again, immunizations don't give you the illness. When you have those symptoms, and I think I got a tetanus booster this year and um, a shingles vaccine, and I did feel like a little bit fevery and fluish. And if you have that experience yourself, know that that's a good sign. Your body, like someone did the, the doorbell dish, they knocked on the door, and your immune system said, what's going on? And they got ready to fight. And they got ready to fight and they're preparing for the attack by creating antibodies. And so that does give you a little bit of a strain on your system and you might feel it. But that just means you have a strong immune system that reacted um, to that knock on the door. So that um, discomfort is about preparing your, um, your immune system's preparing for the actual virus if it ever arrives. 
And a little bit just about safety that the FDA has very stringent procedures and processes to develop and approve um, vaccines over time. And also how those vaccines and recommendations are developed. Um, there is a, a lot of discussion, planning, science, research that goes in to any recommendation made by the Centers for Disease Control around a vaccination. And then we always continue to monitor those uh, vaccines. And there is a website where people can um, report any uh, reaction or side effect they consider related to the vaccine. Um, so we are, uh, the CDC is always monitoring people's feedback as well. A little bit about um, immunity. Um, we call it herd immunity, and it's a very simple idea that um, if you have a lot of healthy people but they're not immunized and a virus comes through, then they are susceptible to getting sick. And if you have fewer people who are um, unimmunized, then the virus can't spread. Uh, we call it, it's called herd immunity, we call it community immunity. So if you're protected from a vaccine preventable disease, you can't spread it. A lot of people say or tell me, I got a flu vaccine and then I got sick. So it takes about two weeks and for many um, immunizations, it takes several weeks for immunity antibodies to develop in your system, you're protected. Sometimes people wait till the people around them are sick um, with an illness before they get immunized. So um, you may already have been infected and then um, and, and think that it was the vaccine. So we tell people don't wait till it's in the news or around you before you get immunized. Um, get a vaccine when it's available. We call it community immunity. Um, there's Elvis Presley, I like this actress, Amanda Peet, she's getting immunized, a uh, former president. And community immunity means that if I'm protected from a vaccine preventable disease, then I can't give it to a baby, I can't give it to a pregnant woman, I can't give it to a senior, I can't give it to someone um, who has cancer. So um, we, we call it public health for a reason. You get vaccinated to protect yourself, but also protect the people around you. On to immunizations that are recommended for pregnant women. So all pregnant women are recommended to receive both the flu vaccine anytime during their pregnancy and the whooping cough vaccine called Tdap early in their third trimester for each pregnancy. So they would repeat that. But right now only one in three women are heeding that recommendation. So it's putting them and their newborns at a lot of risk for disease or even death. If you want a link or a resource about vaccines that are recommended for pregnant women, um, there's a link below. And also, feel free to, uh, I'll watch the chat box. I don't know what you recommend, Charlene, if you want to take questions at the end, but I will pay attention. Um, a very quick um, image about why um, vaccines are important, and it's they're protecting the mother, but they're also passing those antibodies on to a baby during pregnancy. So babies can't get vaccinated. A baby with, uh, can't get vaccinated for flu for the first six months. They are very vulnerable during that time to being infected with respiratory diseases. And a baby uh, for Tdap, for pertussis, their first dose I think starts at two weeks and they need uh, four doses that first year to be protected. So that um, passing on of protection is really critical. And uh, going back, what is flu? We know it's a respiratory disease. You're gonna get um, fever, muscle aches. I mean, when you get the flu, it's kind of different in a cold. I always think like a cold might kind of slowly come on, but when you get the flu, it sort of like hits you like a truck. It's like a boom. Uh, most adults don't get diarrhea and vomiting, but it's, it is very common in children. Um, and though everyone can get the flu, including very healthy, healthy people, older people, pregnant women, young children, and people who have chronic illnesses are much higher risk for complications, long-term complications, hospitalization, and death. So again, here's more about the people who are highest risk for developing 
complications. And we are concerned right now about pregnant women and young children and newborns. About a fifth of the population will get flu every year. That's, that's a lot of people, one in five. Most of us, though, can stay home and get rest if we you know, take uh, fevers down and stay hydrated and, um, and rest. It takes about a week to get rid of the flu. If you've had a bad flu, you know it takes much longer, though. It really wipes your immune system out. You are exhausted. You might have fatigue for several weeks. And that's um, during that time you are susceptible to other secondary infections, infections that you might have normally had no problem resisting or fighting off. Um, a lot of child deaths that we see, they recover from the flu, but several days later succumb to some other minor secondary infection and die. Um, so flu takes a huge toll on your body. Um, as, we, as I noted earlier, an average of 200,000 people every year are hospitalized, and um, we had 100 and almost 160 flu deaths last year in the U.S. Um, let me see. We've, right now, we've had 150, 105 people in California die of flu, and we've had um, five children for this flu season. Again, it's, it's the same um, mechanism as I talked about how immunizations work. The immunization works the same. Your body gets activated to create antibodies. Of course, it's a false alarm because it's not really the flu, but your body goes ahead and makes those antibodies anyway, which is great. You get exposed to the flu um, through your eyes, nose, or mouth. And um, even if you get infected, let's say you got a, a vaccinated with flu, even if you do happen to get flu, it is going to decrease how long your flu lasts and the severity of the disease. So some protection is always better than no protection. There is um, something called flu mist, and that's for, I think, people under 40 or 45. I'll have to look. I apologize. But kids love flu mist because they can inhale it and no uh, needle. For children, when they get the flu vaccination for the first time, they're going to need two doses. So you don't need to worry about um, this um, particular um, detail because if they go to the provider, they're going to screen them and ask this question. But if a child has already had two doses of flu um, in their lifetime, they'll only need one dose. But if they've never been immunized for flu, they're going to need two doses. Two weeks, again, is how long it will take to develop those an antibodies once you've been vaccinated. You know this, but flu is contagious. It's really contagious. And I think one of the things, um, that uh, we're looking to see with the coronavirus is true of flu is that people can spread flu, you are contagious before you yourself have symptoms. So before a day or two or several days before you know you're sick, you can give flu to someone else. Um, you're the most contagious during the first uh, couple of days after you have symptoms and you can uh, affect people for after a week. It's why we want people to stay home when they're sick. A lot of people have told me, I've never had a flu shot. I've never had the flu. I think most everybody has probably had the flu. Maybe you didn't know it was the flu. Maybe one day you just felt crummy. You felt really low and tired and sort of brushed it off. And the next day, you felt better. But during that time, you did have flu. And you gave it to an old person. You gave it to a child. You gave it to a baby. So you get immunized for yourself and you get immunized for the people around you. So flu is difficult because you can infect people before you yourself have symptoms. Can I get vaccinated and still get the flu? Yes. No immunization is 100% effective. They're not a silver bullet. This goes back to that idea of community immunity. The less people who are, who are sick, the fewer chances the virus has to spread. That's true of any vaccine preventable disease. But again, the flu will be, will be less severe and will um, be shorter duration. Um, every year they guess, a very, very informed, complicated guess about what strains of virus should go into a flu vaccine. 
What's tricky about flu and why we keep having to get flu immunizations every year is because the virus is always shifts, always mutating, always changing. So they look at those parts of the country in Australia when it's their summer, it's our winter, our winter, their summer, and they look during their flu season for those parts of the world who get flu before we do. They see what's circulating. The top experts, the Centers for the Disease Control, the World Health Organization, who's like the CDC, but for the world, and they all get together and they have conversations and, and evaluate what strains are circulating and they um, put those into the vaccine. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't because again, the, the virus is always shifting, but it will um, provide you some protection. There's a lot of myths always about flu vaccines. Again, and this is um, hopefully something that you'll feel comfortable responding to people when they, when they share these with you. So common, you can get the flu from flu immunizations. Um, no, the vaccine does not replicate. Um, it can't replicate in your body. Even if it's a weakened virus, the, whole, the virus has many parts. The parts they put in there, it needs the other parts to replicate. It can't replicate, so you cannot get the flu from a flu vaccine. The flu is just a bad cold. No, we, we, as we discussed earlier, it, it, a lot of people die every year from the flu. Uh, and causes thousands of hospitalizations. I just read yesterday about a teenage girl, didn't feel good, they thought she had a bad cold. This was, I wanna say Kentucky. Um, she got sick on December 23rd, she thought she had a bad cold. Um, she didn't get better, she had problems breathing. They took her to the hospital, they did a chest x-ray, it looked okay. She did some selfies, she was like, she had a nasal cannula that she felt good enough to um, take pictures and talk to friends. And I think within three days she had died and she was vulnerable after her flu to another um, bacteria, which was pneumonia and she passed away. So you see very healthy people, unfortunately, um, succumbing to flu every season. It's painful as a public health person to see that in small children as well. Um, people say flu immunizations don't work. The vaccine does vary every year, but again, some protection is better than none. Why is flu immunization so important for pregnant women? We already, uh, I already showed that it's, it's more likely to cause severe illness in pregnant women. And the reason for that is, is that when a woman is pregnant, when a person is pregnant, your immune system is a little bit suppressed so that you won't miscarry the pregnancy. And um, you are having great changes to your immune system, your heart and lungs. Um, and there's also, as the pregnancy grows, there's, you know, women may have more difficulty breathing, so you have less lung capacity, but there are changes that make women more susceptible to severe illness from the flu. They're more than twice as likely to be hospitalized if they're pregnant, that's really significant. And they're more um, at increased risk for really serious complications when they get sick, including pneumonia and dehydration and even preterm labor. Uh, and finally, fever, which is really common with the flu, and it's one of the signs that you probably have flu, um, can be damaging to the baby and, call, and cause birth defects. So prevention is where we wanna be with flu. And, um, how safe are they? They've been giving to millions of women over time. Um, flu uh, vaccines no longer have their marisol, which is a mercury preservative. Um, vaccine, flu vaccine is safe for breastfeeding women, and the CDC again recommends that every woman get a flu um, vaccine during any trimester, trimester anytime during her pregnancy. Protects her and her baby from flu. Charlene, how am I doing with time? I have a million slides, but I'm just, am I doing okay here? Okay. You are totally, um, doing totally fine. Okay, okay, great. Um, and folks, if you are, questions? If you go, type it off. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll 
watch the chat box and you can interrupt me too, Charlene, if I don't see them. Okay. If you're if you're Sounds visiting a um, well, home and you see a, if you uh, are visiting a home and you see a woman who might be sick with flu flu, she needs to call her doctor. Um, we talk, you know, in discussing all her risks for complications, her risk for hospitalization, the risk of um, danger to her pregnancy. She needs treatment early, and the best thing for that pregnant woman, if she does have flu, is to get an antiviral. For a lot of us, if we get flu, the best thing you can do is get an antiviral, but you need to get them within the first 48 hours of being sick. No later than that, are they, they aren't going to help you. They make your illness milder, um, recover faster. They can prevent those serious complications, but they require prescription. So, um, Antivirals are recommended, but they need to feel um, confident enough. They've got to call their doctor and not wait. Of course, any difficulty breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, dizziness, um, should call 911. One of the questions um, I heard was, is, can flu be transmitted through breast milk? No. So, um, Breast milk provides really important antibodies and immunity to a baby, so um, it can actually prevent that baby from getting sick and provide the a nutrition and support they need, even when um, mom is ill. So if she's too sick, um, they CDC recommends that she pump her breast. Um, women should always wash their hands if they have flu, and they may need additional. Um, lactation support, and that's probably something you have resources or recommendations for. Infants who have the flu, can they continue to breastfeed? It's possible, yes. Again, it's the best type of antibody support and protection that a baby can get is from breast milk. If a baby has flu, the mom should be encouraged to keep breastfeeding or pump and provide milk to her um, baby. They need to stay hydrated. Being hydrated when you have flu is so critical for adults, but super critical for infants. So um, breast milk is best. And um, again, it can be given through cup or syringe. There's a link at the bottom of the page for, um, for more, on, more information on that. If a mom is sick with flu, she should take the same precautions as we all should when we're um, when we have to wash your hands, always washing the hands before um, she holds or cares for baby, changes diaper, et cetera. So um, we get really excited about hand sanitizers, which all you want to do is wash those viruses off your hands, and soap and water by far is the superior method to do that. So for all of us during um, flu season, wash your hands, and if possible, again. Um, covering our cough, coughing into our elbows, not shaking hands, um, not touching your face a lot, which can bring virus to your face, or rubbing your eyes. To reiterate, uh, flu vaccination is the best protection against flu. It lowers her risk of, of hospitalization by 40% if she's been vaccinated for flu. Babies who have the highest risk for hospitalization uh, reduce the risk of, by 72% of being hospitalized. And not just the mom needs to be immunized. Everybody who might be around that baby in a very close way, other people who live in the house and friends and um, relatives or caretakers also need to get an immunization for flu. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Cover your coughs and your sneezes. Stay home if you're sick. Uh, try to avoid contact with people who are sick. Wash your hands. Um, get the flu vaccine. And here's a link for more resources and flyers and posters that relate to different aspects of the community, but we have a section on there for pregnant women as well. Messaging. I'm going to um, switch over to pertussis now. It's also called, um, cause, excuse me, called whooping cough. It's a highly respiratory disease. For some reason, um, we have waves of infection for pertussis. Every four years, it seems like we have a much worse outbreak. Um, it can affect everyone, but for babies, it's deadly. And I think those are the only people who end up uh, succumbing to uh, pertussis or whooping cough or are very young babies. 
Um, of course, the best way to protect against uh, a newborn being infected is if the mom's immunized and the baby can start being immunized for whooping cough at two months and they'll get several doses over that first year. Pertussis is known for that uncontrollable cough. So if you enter a home, I'm going to play you the cough and maybe you are familiar with it, but just it's, it's disturbing, but it's something to be aware of because if a baby is coughing like that, they need immediate attention. Okay, I'm seeing if I can, sorry about that. Trying to get this, of course, when you want something to go, it doesn't. I might have an advertisement at the beginning. Let's see if we can get this. Sorry, thanks for your patience. All right, sorry. We have to wait for the commercial. Three row Subaru Ascent. Love So you can hear the whoop, and it's why they call it whooping cough. So if you enter a home and a child has that type of cough, or you hear that whooping sound, they need immediate care. It can be very serious and deadly for a newborn. And they're having a hard time breathing. That coughing really makes it difficult to breathe. I have a link to that whooping sound here. All pregnant women should get a vaccine for pertussis in their third trimester. It's called Tdap. And every subsequent pregnancy, they need to get a booster. So every pregnancy, they'll get a, another dose of this. Um, immunity for pertussis from that vaccine wanes. It means it goes down over time. And children now in school are required to have another booster um, in um, the seventh grade, I believe. Again, going back to that herd and community immunity, anybody who might be around the newborn also needs to be vaccinated because that's most likely where children are going to be infected with um, pertussis. They're going to get it from someone um, else in the family. The next illness uh, I want to talk briefly about is perinatal hepatitis B. And all children, all newborns get vaccinated for hepatitis B. But if a mom, a pregnant woman, is already infected with hepatitis B, she has a high risk of transmitting that virus to her no, newborn during um, childbirth. When you are infected with hepatitis B later in your life, it's a very chronic, um, treatable, but not curable um, disease of your liver. But if you are infected as a newborn from your mom to you during childbirth, um, very high chance that you will die uh, before you're 60. So there is a vaccine that all newborns get, but there is a special, what we call a prophylaxis, a preventive measure for newborns. So we have, um, and in certain countries in the world, uh, hepatitis B is more prevalent. And so um, all, women, it, all women are screened for uh, hepatitis B when they get prenatal care. Uh, and we follow up with each uh, positive result we get at the Department of Public Health. But it would be so helpful. Every baby gets a prophylaxis when they're born, and then they have to get a series of vaccines after birth to make sure they are completely protected. And so um, I just want to, uh, and that's something that we will follow up with all women, but I wanted all of you to have information. We have a lot of great materials on our website. Um, and so I've included links to them here so you can learn more about this um, disease. I mean, preventing it is so critical. Measles. So if, um, and I, I think a lot of us have heard about the increase of measles. We had very few cases several years ago, but we've had a resurgence. This is not going to go away. We have, um, I think, what did I say earlier, how many measles cases we had? We had in, in uh, 
2017, we had 120 cases and it went up to 1,200. There are half a million um, cases worldwide of measles. It is circulating right now. There are plenty of places uh, where measles exist and people who travel are at particular vulnerability for being infected. A baby can't get vaccinated for measles um, usually until their first year. Women, when they're pregnant, there's a very, very small risk for complications if they get a measles vaccination called an MMR. It's a combination of measles, mumps, and rubella. So we encourage women who are considering pregnancy or in between pregnancies, if they need a booster, if they've only had two doses, they might need three. It has to be 28 days before um, conception, before they're pregnant. So something you might want to recommend and remind women. Um, and here's some links and some flyers uh, information for the public. Uh, measles, I don't think, is going to avoid, go away. I think we're going to keep seeing it. And, and, and most people um, who've gotten measles in the U.S. were not vaccinated. Um, but no vaccine is 100%. So people who were vaccinated with measles here also got sick. If you have a family who's traveling outside of the country and they have a baby under 12 months years, uh, 12 months old of age, they should get an early dose of the MMR. So I've put information here. Usually they get their first dose at 12 months, so if they're gonna be traveling somewhere where there might be measles, they should get an early dose. So if you hear those plans, um, be aware of what the recommendations are. I want to switch to speaking about vaccine hesitancy. The World Health Organization has brought it to our attention that all these things that are so um, uh, the top threats to our health, Ebola, HIV, climate change, but including um, now is vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy means that you are postponing or rejecting or refusing immunization. Why we've seen an increase in people who don't want to be vaccinated is because it's kind of a, a catch-22. We haven't seen a lot of these diseases in a long time. We haven't seen smallpox. If you've ever happened to see smallpox or polio, um, you're going to remember to get vaccinated, but we haven't seen these diseases. There's more distrust. People are more concerned about their own health maybe than for the health of other people. There's so much information and a lot of information, misinformation, information confusing. Sometimes not always easy to pay for and find. And then just a lot of pressure in your own community. You're more likely to do what uh, the people you know and trust do. A lot of attitudes and beliefs about why people don't want to be vaccinated, thinking it's better to get sick than get a vaccine. They don't work. The diseases aren't that bad. Um, so that there aren't good benefits. A lot of different beliefs. I go back to this idea that when we're vaccinated against a disease, we're holding up the door. Us well people, all of us who are able, some people can't get vaccinated. Small babies can't get vaccinated. People who might have chronic illnesses may not be able to get, uh, with cancer may not be able to get immunized. So we hold the door, we create safety, we create immunity in our communities by being vaccinated. And when you choose not to be vaccinated, you're putting everybody else at risk. It's like you're, you're one of these people holding up the door and you're walking away and letting the other people hold up the door. Um, and when we hold the door, we're protecting again, we're creating a circle of protection around pregnant women, around seniors, around people who might have a compromised, compromised immune system and, and of course newborns. Very, very few people are refusing. We hear a lot about anti-vax. The majority of all people accept immunizations, um, required immunizations. Um, it's a very small amount. But even so, even for someone like myself, I don't love getting an injection. It's not my favorite thing. I'm not clamoring, even if I really want to. And it, it, so all of us have a little bit of vaccine hesitancy. And vaccine hesitancy just isn't I don't like needles. It's I have questions. How am I going to feel after I take this? Does it really work? Is this really the best thing for my child? Is this the best thing for me? So I think it's healthy and normal to be a little bit hesitant, um, and we shouldn't judge that. We should um, 
figure out what's causing that hesitancy. A lot of, I'm not gonna go way into this study, but a lot of times we just think people just need to understand, they just need more information. And, and this particular study just showed that getting a lot of information, whether scaring people, showing graphic images, more um, stories, it didn't change um, what people thought about um, immunization. And the difference I think is you, the difference is the conversations and the trust you build with a client that you can help a parent to feel confident about their decision to vaccinate. We are going to not fight um, vaccine hesitancy or fear of vaccines with, um, with more science or with threats all the time. It has to be with trust. Um, and we have to honor people's questions, concerns about vaccines. A lot of those questions will be about the side effects and the safety, but also the benefits. And as you know, what you say really matters. I know all of you know this because you go into the home and this is what you do. You talk to clients but we can't um, conquer that hesitancy, especially with uh, flu immunizations, just with, with fear. We really have to hear where people are coming from. Um, and the woman who um, is the head, the director of the CDC of uh, Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, her name's Nancy Messonet, I really like her, and she's overseeing the coronavirus outbreak at the CDC right now, but her quote is, we need to emphasize the strong science that validates potentially life-saving benefits of immunization, but combine it with patience and empathy. And I know that's what you all do every day, allowing people to share their concerns and questions in a, in a professional and respectful manner. Um, a lot of mistakes, and I know I'm guilty of this because I'm frustrated with people who may not want to get vaccinated. I, I need to show them that they're wrong and I'm right. Um, I assume that they're going to understand what I'm talking about. I give them too much information or I'm, I'm, I'm sharing information they may not even want. Um, you know, all know this too, it's, uh, you know, honey gets the bee and it's much more productive um, to, for communication, to have communication that is respectful and collaborative, that's empathetic versus shaming or scaring. And these are the aspects I just want to emphasize, ask and listen, acknowledge, empathy, respect, dispelling myths, using personal stories, key messages, be informed, provide information. Questions that the family have are gonna be critical too. I, I think pregnant women now are under more pressure than ever from their families because they themselves might have read something on the internet or their family you know, they're afraid. People are like, well, you would, I would never get a, I would never get an immunization. I would never get a flu vaccination if I was pregnant. Um, so they have a lot of pressure and questions. And um, so I think it's important to ask if they have hesitancy and to listen about what they're, uh, let them share what their concerns are. And to acknowledge that this is difficult. They're pregnant, a lot of strong emotions and fears. It's a difficult decision. Again, that empathy and respect, and this is a thing that I want to think of all people who are trying to improve their health and the health of their families. We always assume that pregnant women are attempting to make the best decisions for themselves in their, in their um, pregnancy. Sometimes pregnant women are afraid more of doing something wrong than in doing something right. So um, immunization seems like a scary choice for them sometimes, but they do want what's best for themselves. And maybe they're not ready for that um, immunization recommendation for a flu, but in, in developing trust with you, they're more ready. When you have the opportunity, if people share these ideas with you that they're not safe, that if they, they heard about some vitamin, that these diseases aren't so bad, that the vaccine actually gives you the flu, that you yourselves will feel confident and proactive about dispelling those myths. I like to use personal stories. I got vaccinated. I think vaccines are the best choice for me. Um, I believe in protecting everyone. I was afraid of the pain of the needle or I was afraid of the pain of the needle for my child, but it wasn't that bad. And now I know I'm protected, I know they're protected. I got the flu vaccine and I didn't get the flu. So personal stories um, go a long way, I think. Having key messages um, that you can repeat. I can help you get information. I understand that it's difficult. Um, the best way to prevent these diseases is to get an immunization. Stay informed, find out what's going on. There's the CDC newsroom, maybe it's like too much TMI. We have an LA HON, which is an alert, uh, health alert where you can subscribe to these and get 
information about what's happening, but be alert about what's happening and affects you and it um, impacts your clients. Provide information on, I gave a link to our um, webpage. We have a, uh, for all people who are under or uninsured, um, what vaccines are available at our clinics. There's also the vaccine finder. Um, you can call 211 and find um, a source of immunization for them. Most of the questions, again, are about safety and benefits, and CDC has a toolkit. It's really aimed towards health providers. Um, I consider you all in that category because you go in the home. So having conversations with parents about immunization. To learn more about immunization, here's a couple of links. I really like immunize.org. They have some great resources. Get immunize.ca, which is the Department of Public Health in California the CDC and then our website has all kinds of flyers in, in multiple languages available. And here is my contact information and uh, the website for public health and uh, the Vaccine Preventable Disease Control Program. And that's our direct line if you have questions about immunization. Thanks for your time. If you have questions, um, hope I, hopefully I can answer them. Anita, thank you so much for your presentation. We have a couple of uh, comments in the chat box. Uh, one of our home visitors, our parent coach supervisors, mentioned that as a home visitor, we usually hear that babies can get autism. I think this was in relation to uh, the concerns that can come up uh, regarding vaccines. Uh, another question that we had is, uh, is it okay for a person to get the MMR vaccine twice if they do not remember if they got it as a child or teen? Would there be any side effects? I'll start with that one. Absolutely, there will be no side effects. A lot of times people prefer, and sometimes health insurance, I know Kaiser, will actually test your immunity. The result is called your titer, like what are your titers, to see how much immunity you have in your system for a particular um, disease. Um, I was born during a year when the measles vaccine wasn't that effective, so I got additional dose. I know I had two, but I got another. It's never going to hurt you. Um, so, especially if you're doing international travel and you're not sure what your titers are, if you are born after 1970 um, and you know you got two doses, you are certainly covered for um, measles. But if you're not sure that you got two doses, then absolutely you can go to your healthcare provider or your pharmacy um, and get an additional dose. It won't, it won't help you. If you're looking to see um, which vaccines, I see some, someone asked which vaccines are mandatory, you can go to the CDC website. They have a full schedule there. You can go to the public, uh, the link on the public health page. You can email me. But, um, you know, school requirements are getting um, more comprehensive. So um, there's going to be, if, if kids are going to participate in public schools, um, private or religious um, schools, besides being homeschooled, they will be required to get um, comprehensive. And the medical exemptions that are available now are going to get more stringent. Um, and so I think that will help our community immunity. The more children, and children, I call them the cootie spreaders of the world just by their nature. They're out and about and they're playing and having a good time and doing their thing. And they, they spread a lot of um, vaccine preventable disease. They're not the best hand washers. Um, and so I, I feel comforted that we're going to have uh, a, a stronger blanket of protection with children. This question of autism is one that we hear over and over, and it's super frustrating and um, as a public health person, and, but understandable that you would hear this because it has captured um, people's imagination and really gotten itself ingrained into people's thinking about the safety. There was a physician uh, and a researcher um, who published a paper about um, immunization being impacted, uh, uh, causing autism, and particularly the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. It was shown mm -hmm. that not only did he forge the data, make it up, he also received bribes or payments from lawyers who were interested in people suing for damages from measles, 
rubella vaccine. His medical license was revoked. Of course, the, the article was revoked. Um, there was just another study that came out in, in 2019 where they looked at uh, more than half a million uh, births in, um, in Europe for prevalence of autism related to MMR. There were many studies with millions of children done in the US, but the 2019 one was the most recent. There's never been any association uh, made with autism and vaccination, none whatsoever. So I appreciate the question. The, 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 the word was spread um, quite and through celebrity and through media, um, but there's absolutely been zero link for autism um, to immunization. And I hope that you share that with people so that that was, and I can, I can find some other links as well, Charlene, and send um, some videos or information specifically that's easy to recant or share with people about that issue. Great, thank you. We'd really appreciate that. We definitely still have uh, a couple of minutes for questions. So if you have uh, any questions or feedback, please go ahead and type it into the chat box. Uh, we will share Ivita's uh, presentation, uh, the PowerPoint, along with the recording as well uh, after this call. So you'll, as, uh, as usual, you'll get a, an email from us with all this information and the references. If you have questions uh, that you think of later, feel free to email me directly. I'm happy to answer. Or if you're looking for specific resources uh, for your visit, um, let me know as well. I know that was a lot of information, <laughs> sorry to bombard you, but I hope that all of you feel confident and good and really good about being able to share this information with your clients. Um, it's so nice, it's such a, a luxury and honor on my end that I get to prevent disease. Um, and it's um, just such critical information. And you yourself, you know, I hope that you will consider um, addressing your own hesitancy when it comes to either vaccine for flu or whatever it might be, and knowing that you are um, in contact with really vulnerable populations and that um, in protecting yourself, you protect your clients. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions coming through the chat box, but Ivita, thank you again so much for uh, the presentation. I think we find the information really useful. Um, and we know it's uh, it's ever changing as well. In every every season we have there's updates, so we'll definitely make sure to utilize these resources that you've said. And thank you for being available for questions as well. Uh, we'll be sure Great. to share thank this you, contact Charlie. information.